Hello, everyone, and welcome back to GRASP's Student, Faculty, and Industry Talk Series. Uh, this week, I'm excited to introduce our second GRASP of the semester, Ola Ribkin. Uh, he's a third year PhD student in CIS working with Professor Kostas Danilidis. Before coming to GRASP, he was a student at the Czech Technical University in Prague, where he earned his bachelor's in CS and was awarded the Dean's Outstanding Thesis Award. In his time at Penn, he's already made several contributions to the intersection of computer vision, robotics, and deep learning. Uh, he has a knack for drumming up productive collaborations outside of GRASP uh, and has spent time at the French National Institute for Research in Computer Science and Automation, the Tokyo Institute of Technology, and UC Berkeley, uh, and has worked with some great researchers, researchers at many other institutions as well. Uh, today, specifically, he's going to be telling about us about his recent work entitled Scale, Scalable Visual Model-Based Reinforcement Learning. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Oleg and we can get started. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, so I think I, you can hear me, right? Uh, I imagine you can hear me well. Right, thanks for the very nice introduction. And yeah, I, I am a fourth year PhD student, I believe. I think you said third, but that's a, it's a minor point. Otherwise, yeah, this is, uh, this is great. So the, yeah, hi everybody, I'm Oleg. And um, as Matt said, I'm going to talk about my work on visual model-based reinforcement learning. Um, I do want to say that I'm I'm actually very excited about about model based RL. So if you're interested in anything I'm going to talk about today, or or just want to chat about general RL topics, definitely feel free to reach out. Should be fairly easy um, if you're in grasp or otherwise. So let me start with a, a bit of high level motivation of why you might care about this, why you might care about visual model based RL. I'm a deep learning person, and as such, of course, the big motivation for much of my research is the problem of building intelligent machines. In particular, I'm really excited about building intelligent machines that can act in the real world, a bit like intelligent robots from fiction movies. This goal might be fairly far off, but let's see where we stand today and what's missing. Current artificial intelligent methods have gotten quite good in many areas. We can now learn dexterous manipulation, have impressive locomotion like running and jumping, and we have cars on the roads that seem to know how to drive. Is this good enough? Well, not quite. The dirty secret of all of these systems is that they're very specific to the situation that they were trained on or built for. Uh, the robot hand here can only manipulate that particular object, and it's no good to ask if we wanted to grasp an arbitrary object as humans are able to do. The humanoid robot is good at executing that particular motion, but the real world is messy and requires handling situations which you might have never seen before. Similarly, autonomous cars generally work fine only until something unexpected happens. The big and so far unanswered question here is how do we build agents that are better at generalizing and can adapt to new situations and tasks? In order to generalize to new situations like this, it is not enough to just memorize the policy that solved the training tasks, but the agent needs to have some internal knowledge that is general and holds for all objects and all situations. There are several ways in which you could try to obtain and represent that knowledge, but if you look at neuroscience and cognitive science, the ability to generalize to new situations and tasks which is present in humans and some other animals, is associated with the ability to predict the outcomes of actions and build models of the world. Uh, this idea of using predictive model is also well cited in control as model-based control, as I'm sure many of you know, and that it has already yielded many useful results. So let's try and see how this works. In model-based control, we have an agent and an environment where the agent is supposed to execute some tasks. The agent also has a model that can be used for prediction, and if the environment is stochastic, you need a probabilistic model which is the distribution over the next observation given all previous observations and actions. Using this model, we can construct plans as to how to solve a task where we define planning as maximizing the expected return. Now, equipped with this algorithm for solving tasks, let's see what we need to use it on a complex real world tasks like, like one of the, those that um, I've just shown you before. The big problem here is that building the model is actually very hard because of complex interactions that are required. So how can we manage to build a good model for these environments? I think our best bet for this is to use data-driven techniques like deep learning. Luckily for us, this problem looks a lot like supervised learning, which we know works really well for complex domains like vision, speech, or language. The recipe for supervised learning is collect a large data set, train the model in it by maximizing likelihood, and then you are ready to use the model. The process may be repeated to collect additional data if you want. An important thing to realize about the setup 
in contrast to manually designing the model is that its predictive power can be easily scaled by simply using a more powerful deep neural network. In particular, this works just fine if your observations are images and you are trying to directly predict future frames. Here's an example prediction output by a neural network like that. And here's a corresponding execution of the plan in the real world. The prediction is definitely very blurry, but it works well enough for control in this case. This is a fairly nice property for us since we no longer need to care about designing a low dimensional state space and state estimators. So actually all, all of the results that I'm going to present in this talk are exactly in this regime where the model is trying to predict image observations directly. All right, so this is why I'm interested in visual model-based reinforcement learning. It is model-based so that it can capture general knowledge about the world, learning because designing models is hard and visual because they don't want to be restricted by manual design of the state space. But how can we make this scalable to very complex tasks and environments? I think we need to improve every part of the current pipeline. We can roughly divide the pipeline in these three parts. There is data collection, model learning, and planning. And today I'm going to tell you some ideas about how we can improve each of these three parts. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the four following directions I have explored. How we can collect data that's not specific to a particular task via self-supervision, how we might leverage large scale sources of human collected data, how do we improve current probabilistic latent variable models, and how do we scale planning to longer horizons? And we'll see how many of these I'll actually get through, but I'll try to cover it as much as I can do. All right, so let's start with the first project, which is self-supervised data collection. And uh, the main question here, which is also the main question of this talk really, is whether we can design agents that learn general and reusable knowledge, just as I promised in the beginning, and whether you can do this with model-based agents. Now, when I started talking about model-based agents, you might have wondered whether model three RL is really not good for this. Model three RL has shown some very impressive results in several domains, for instance, video games and board games, and even robotic tasks in simulation and real world. So maybe it would also be suitable for building generalist autonomous machines. However, Note that these agents are usually trained for a single specific task from scratch and require a large amount of task specific interaction for each task. The policy learned by these agents transfers poorly to new tasks. One could try to make model three level more generalizable. And indeed there's plenty of work on self-supervised reinforcement learning where instead of solving a particular task, the agent has to learn skills that will be useful for other tasks later. Some of this recent work scales to visual observations and learns behavior that is quite impressive. However, it is unclear how to use these approaches to solve new tasks. Since they simply learn a self-supervised policy, adapting it to a new task requires fine tuning on that task, which is very inefficient. In this example, the ICM, the Intrinsic Curiosity module, allows fine tuning that is faster than training from scratch, but still requires millions of samples. In a more recent paper, and I, I find this fairly ironic, a, a procedure called fast task inference requires 100,000 steps to adapt to a new task. This can be fast for some use cases, but for real robotic learning, we want much faster adaptation. Specifically, in this work, we will want a self-supervised model-based agent that is able to adapt to a new task in a zero-shot manner. In our ICML 2020 paper, joined with Roman and Sekar, we proposed exactly that. We proposed plan to explore, which is an agent that can do it, uh, that, that can generalize in a zero-shot way, and it works directly from images. Here's how this works. Plan to explore, interacts with the environment without rewards in order to collect new data. It then uses the data to train the world model. And once the model is updated, the agent seeks to improve the model further by collecting novel data with an appropriate exploration strategy. After the model is trained in such self-supervised manner, we can use it to solve a specified task, such as standing, walking, or running in this case. And we can use any of these new tasks with a single model because this model is self-supervised and it doesn't actually care about what the task is going to be at test time. It just tries to learn some general and reusable knowledge, which is going to be the main theme here. All right, let's uh, look at, at this in a little bit more detail. The plan to explore agent uh, takes in the input image as the observation and generates features via an encoder, which is a convolutional network. The features are then converted into a latent state of a world model, which is a predictive dynamics form model. Given this latent state, uh, we use a planner that generates the exploratory actions that are executed in the environment. A replay buffer collects the observation action and next observation, and the buffer is used to train the world model. 
We don't use any rewards at this point because we don't want to be specific to a particular task. So we don't assume that the task is known. The key ideas that we use to make this work are as follows. First, we use long-term planning with the world model to explore the environment uh, to collect novel data. And the data is used to train the model further to improve the exploration. The same model is later used to plan for a new task at test time. Let's now look into the architecture of our predictive model. We use a probabilistic latent state model to generate imagined rollouts of future latent states. The model takes in a given feature of an observation and using the current latent state in action, it predicts the next states. To define the exploration objective, we generate self-supervised intrinsic rewards given each latent state in the imagined rollout. The intrinsic reward needs to estimate the novelty of a given latent state, and it also has to be easily computable. Can we design a metric of novelty using our existing predictive model? Let's look uh, at a couple choices of possible intrinsic rewards. A reasonable metric to use is model error. That is, states where a prediction doesn't work are the ones that are more novel. This seems reasonable at first, but it actually suffers from a significant flaw. A better choice might be measuring the novelty with some estimate of uncertainty, such as a variance of an ensemble of models, which we call model disagreement. Let's see how these two choices behave in more detail. In the first case, we consider the environment is deterministic and there's only one possible future observation here shown as a blue dot. The model prediction here in red will be far from the true observation for novel data, but as the model is trained for longer, it will become closer. Similarly, all models in the ensemble will be initialized, uh, will be initially far from the data, sorry, uh, and far from each other. They, they are also gonna be far from each other because they're randomly initialized. But they will eventually converge to the same solution for the data that have already been seen. So both the model error and the disagreement so far seem good as they're large on novel data and small on familiar data. However, what if your environment is noisy, such that there are multiple possible future observations? In this case, the deterministic model will converge to the mean prediction, but will still have very high model error, even on the data that have already been seen. In contrast, if you have an ensemble, all models in the ensemble will converge to the mean and the disagreement will be low for the seen data. The model exploration strategy, the, sorry, the model error strategy will uh, get stuck in noisy environments, while the model disagreement does not suffer from this issue. This happens because the model error metric conflates the intrinsic uncertainty of the environment with the uncertainty about model parameters, while the model disagreement only captures the uncertainty about the model parameters. In the paper, we further formally show that the ensemble disagreement approximates the information gained by our agent about the environment, confirming this intuitive analysis. So, all right, so because of this, we use latent disagreement of a bootstrap ensemble as an intrinsic reward. Um, this is implemented by training a, an ensemble of one-step models where each takes in the latent state in action and predicts the next image embedding. Then we can compute the intrinsic reward as the variance in the mean of these predictions of the next image embeddings. A practical detail is that the ensemble is composed of these light step one-step models that predict the encoding of the image. So this is computationally scalable. Now these intrinsic rewards uh, are used as the objective to plan for exploratory actions so that we can collect novel data. To optimize for uh, these exploratory actions, we use the following procedure. To plan for long horizon behaviors, we use a learned value function. And for fast inference, we amortize the planning procedure by training a parametric policy to produce actions. Uh, I do wanna note here that this policy is learned by a planning in the imagination of the world model without any new real world interactions. To construct the full training loop for this method, we then interleave the updates for the model, policy, and new data collection. Let's now see some self-supervised exploration behaviors learned by our agent. We evaluate this agent on uh, 20 continuous control tasks using high dimensional image observations as the only input. Our agent is able to learn effective exploration strategies on these continuous control tasks. Uh, so you can see that um, the agent goes far from, from its initial state and generally it explores fairly well, much better than uh, any kind of random exploration that wouldn't get you too far uh, and wouldn't give you diverse data. However, obviously these behaviors are still meaningless unless you can actually use them for solving new tasks. So let's look at how we can go from exploration to being able to solve tasks. 
Recall that this is our training procedure for Plan to Explore. To solve a new task at test time, we just need to use the trained model to plan for a different reward function. We learn a new task policy completely in the imagination of the world model, which allows us to solve tasks in a zero-shot manner, meaning that uh, once we see the new reward function, we don't need any additional interaction with the world to solve this task. Everything after we see the new reward is happening entirely in the imagination of the world model. Um, and a practical detail here is that to get this uh, reward model, we train a new reward predictor by relabeling the replay buffer with task rewards. Again, happening without any additional interactions. So let's test our agent's ability to solve new tasks. Uh, specifically, uh, here's an outline of the experiments, and we're gonna see if our agent can solve a new task in a zero-shot manner. Look at, uh, we will look at its performance when we provide in a few self supervised episodes, and finally we'll look into the multitask performance. So let's start with the zero-shot uh, solving tasks. Here is the behavior learned by the supervised oracle on these tasks, followed by our zero-shot agents. We see that even though our agent is not allowed to practice this new task, it is able to learn effective policies that solve the task in a zero-shot manner. Some of these tasks are a little, a little special, like the cheetah over here, uh, which learns a very unorthodox policy, uh, but it is effective at solving this task and it achieves a very high reward comparable to that of the Oracle. Quantitatively, our agent, here I'm showing it in green, often achieves comparable performance to the state-of-the-art task-specific Oracle. And the task-specific Oracle is in yellow. On the hopper task, in fact, our agent outperforms the state-of-the-art agent, uh, even though the state-of-the-art agent is allowed to see uh, rewards during exploration and our agent is not. Note that, right, uh, and our agent also only sees raw images and uh, none of the agents I'm showing see the proper receptive state information. So this is purely visual setting. So we see from this experiment that task-specific exploration is not actually necessary to learn effective policies in these a continuous control tasks. There's still a little bit of a gap though between our zero shot agent and the Oracle. So can we bridge this gap, gap somehow? We can look at what happens if we let the agent practice the new task for just 20 super supervised episodes. Comparing the behavior with the Oracle, uh, our agent is able to adapt its behavior to the task very quickly, such as on the half cheetah task, where it actually changes its behavior to a more standard one. So our agent is able to learn an effective model that can be used to solve a range of new tasks. But of course, the real reason we wanted to do this is because we hypothesized that a single model can be solved multiple different tasks so that we don't have to retrain this model for each new task. So does this actually happen with our agent in practice? Here, I'm showing the results uh, of a single model that is being adapted to different tasks, such as running forward, running backward, flipping forward and flipping backward on the cheetah environment. Um, and I'm also comparing this to a task-specific agent that is only trained on running forward. So the task-specific agent fails all of the tasks that it was not trained on. So it solves the task that it was trained on perfectly, but it fails all of the other tasks where it doesn't do better than random exploration. Our task-agnostic agent, in contrast, solves all of the tasks. So it's, it's a little bit worse uh, than the supervised agents on, on the task that the supervised agent was trained on, but it is better on all of the other tasks that are novel. So this confirms our initial hypothesis that uh, this way of training self-supervised agents actually produces agents that are more general and are not restricted to a single task. And this is, this is the main reason I'm really excited about this paper. Um, all right, so this is, um, this is it for the first part of the talk. And in the next part, I'm going to talk about other possible sources of data that we can use to train these models. So, so now we can collect data without supervision and learn the wider range of tasks without being specific to training tasks, as I've just shown. But how much of this data would we need to collect? The worrying news is that it might be a lot. If we take an example of computer vision, uh, there you need a, about a million annotated images in order to learn things like object classification, detection, or what have you. For natural language processing, it is now common to pre-train the models on the entire Wikipedia or even larger data sets. So it is reasonable to guess that for learning a predictive model of the world, we would require a similar order of magnitude of data, if not even more. Where are all, are all these data going to come from? I don't quite know the answer, 
but it is tempting to consider the possibility of learning from other agents, such as humans. Very conveniently, humans have already collected large data sets of uh, video data online, and we just need to leverage them. The ideal pipeline would look something like this. You download the YouTube, where each video is a sequence of observations, train a predictive model in it, and then use this model for planning with robotic agents. There are a few ways in which this could go wrong, but let's start with the fact that it is clearly impossible to train the predictive model because the video data does not contain actions, but the model needs to be action conditioned in order to be useful. For a moment, let's just focus on this technical challenge that we need to overcome in order for this to work. This is where we started in our uh, ICLR 2019 paper with Carl Perch, where we considered learning action representations without action supervision. To see how we can achieve this, let's first formalize the predictive model of the next frame, given the previous frame and the unknown action. I'm going to denote the unknown action as Z, and we will formalize this as a probabilistic graphical model. The PGM, the probabilistic graphical model here, requires defining the prior distribution over the action representation and the predictive distribution of the next frame given the previous frames and the actions, specifically action representations here. Now, what's quite interesting about this formulation is that it does not matter whether the actions are observed or not. You can still train the entire model just by doing maximum likelihood on the observations. What happens if you do that is that the variable Z will learn to represent information that is helpful for predicting the future frame, which is mainly the action of the agent in the image. We will train this model with variational inference which is a fairly standard method for training predictive model that I also used in the previous part of the talk. And variational inference requires an, an inference distribution over Z given both past and future observation. If you don't exactly know how variational inference works, you can, think of it, you can think of it as a bit like an expectation maximization procedure where the inference is the expectation step and learning is the maximization step. Now that we have this intuition and the graphical model, we simply need to use some neural networks to instantiate it. Specifically, we're gonna use a Gaussian prior distribution over Z and a convolutional neural network to predict the future given the Z and the previous observation. To use the entire history of observations, we also make this model recurrent. The inference distribution is implemented with a convolutional importer and the entire model was trained with a variational lower bound on the log likelihood, which consists of a reconstruction and the KL divergence term. So now we have a model that can learn action representations from videos without action data. Does this actually work? To make this practical, we will need a few other ideas. But first, uh, I wanna simply verify that it can learn some reasonable action representations. So we performed this simple controlled experiment where we use this environment with a simple rotational robot with just one degree of freedom. Uh, and what we observed is that the model actually does learn an action representation that can be matched to the true action space. To evaluate this, we use the learned action space to control the agent. And this graph over here shows that uh, our controller reaches the target position up to a very small error, about two degrees in this case. This shows that uh, this action space does actually correspond to the true action space uh, because we, we can actually perform control with it. Now, what's really interesting about this whole procedure is that our model can leverage additional data even if they are not labeled with actions. So in the low data regime, it can outperform other prior work that I'm showing here uh, if our model is provided additional unlabeled data, which means videos that are not labeled with actions. When 10,000 videos are provided, as over here, uh, we see that all methods work well, all methods work well. But with just 100 labeled videos, as over here, uh, our method is the only one that works. And the prior works cannot leverage unlabeled data, so it's just, um, it simply overfits and it's not able to control in this case. Now, this is quite encouraging, but clearly we want to solve more complex task, tasks than this uh, simple one degree of freedom robot. Turns out that this is possible as well, but here we need more than just unsupervised action representations. In contrast to the previous paper that I've just shown, where we have attempted to learn without any action supervision at all, uh, let's modify the problem statement to one where we are also allowed to use a data set of robotic interaction data, in addition to observation videos of humans so that we can ground the human video in the robot experience. Here, we have a data set of videos of humans that are solving a particular task, and also a data set of random robot interaction, which is easy to collect. And I'm actually showing the data that we are going to be using. The setup is still the same. We're going to learn the world model, and we're going to use it for planning to solve robotic tasks. 
Uh, this model is from an ECCB paper work for which was mostly done by Carl Schmeckpaper, who is also a PhD student in Costas's lab and who I believe is also present here. So to implement this, in addition to the previous unsupervised model, we need to add a variable for the actions, which are observed in the robot case and unobserved in the human case. And we will train a network to decode the action from the action representation. The training of this model is fairly similar to the one before. It's just that now there are two different losses. There's one loss for the human and one for the robot video. And for the robot video, we also add another inference network that predicts the action representation back from the action. There are many details that one needs to get right in order for this to work, including some way of adjusting the mind shift between humans and robots. But I'm actually just going to skip the details. And if you're really curious, you should be able to just catch Carl around and I'm sure he can tell you more. Uh, but what I do want to show though is uh, how this works in practice. The previous model I've shown would have a lot of problems on the real world data because there's really nothing that grounded the human actions into the robot actions. But the semi-supervised model uh, in this work actually has much easier time learning this grounding. Let's see how this representation works in practice. On the robot data, we simply have an action prediction network that is supervised and it's trained to predict the end effector movement from the latent representation. I'm showing the predicted um, end effector deltas with these arrows over here. On the human data, this network takes in the learned action representation, which is shared between human and robot data and predicts what would be the corresponding robot action because human action, action labels are not available. And what's really interesting about this is that we actually see that the predictions, the end effector del deltas do closely track the actual movement of the human arm, suggesting that the learned action representation does generalize between the robot and the human, simply as a byproduct of learning to predict in this semi-supervised graphical model that we instantiated with deep neural networks. Now, one can ask, is this ability to learn from human data useful in practice for improving robotic manipulation? And it actually is. Notice that in this video, the human is doing something that is tricky to achieve with robots. It is using a tool. The random robotic data we train on does not contain many tool use instances since random behaviors is unlikely to yield that. But by learning from both robot and human data, the robot is able to learn the physics of tool use and use it for planning. Here, uh, I'm, I wanna show you the robotic planning results. Uh, these are videos of the robot uh, solving tasks that require pushing several objects such that uh, the tool use is the optimal way to solve these tasks. Despite never being trained on robot videos of tool use, the agent is able to solve these tasks and it outperforms the baseline that do not learn from human data. This confirms our initial hypothesis that human data can be used to improve models for model-based reinforcement learning and perhaps provides another way for us to collect large amounts of data that will be necessary to make these models really generalizable and useful in the real world. All right, so, so far we have been talking about this question of how to collect the data that is diverse and high quality. This is very important, but there is of course a lot of interesting problems in what you do once you have collected these data. And there, there's a lot of questions on how to use the data to, to learn agents to that can act in the real world. Since we are doing deep model based RL, we need to train a predictive model. And the next part of the talk is going to be about improving probabilistic predictive models. The big reason I'm excited about this topic is because as you saw in the intro, current predictive models are actually very far from being truly scalable for video prediction. There are many different problems that are still open, but the one I want to talk about today is how to handle stochasticity. When you are doing prediction from images, you're never, never going to be perfect because images do not contain all necessary information about the future. And also just simply because your predictive model is probably not good enough. So you really need to represent uncertainty of your prediction. To get us started, let's look at some common probabilistic models for control that some of you may be well familiar with. Specifically, here's an underlying uh, physical state of, of the system that evolves over time. I will call it Z, uh, because I like this letter, but, but you can call us it S or any other letter really. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, now, given the state, uh, the robot observes some a variable X, which could be a noisy or partial observation of the environment. 
this graphical model over here is of course the graphical model for a partially observable MDP if you forgot to draw the actions. In addition to the generative model of the environment, you will also often need an inverse model, uh, also called a filter. Specifically, if you're only given the observations, you might want to find out what's the underlying state of the environment. If you have these two models, the prediction and the inference model, you're in a good place to do control. But the problem is that getting these models is far from trivial. Uh, in particular, you need to answer questions like how to design the predictive model, how to design the filter, um, and, and how to design the state itself. Now, uh, the part that uh, I think are, is actually the most suspicious is designing the state. If you can't enumerate all tasks and situations your robot will be in, how can you manually create a full description of the state of the environment? I think the state should be at least partially learned. Luckily, machine learning allows us to jointly learn both the generative and the inference model simply by maximizing likelihood. Here, I will treat the Z as an unobserved or latent variable, X as the data, and I will train the predictive distribution with the maximum likelihood of the data. Computing exact likelihood is usually intractable, but one way you could do so is by using variational inference, which I already mentioned several times. Let's look more closely at how variational inference works. In fact, let's start with a simple or graphical model without any temporal information. So what I'm going to talk about now actually applies to all variational models. And particularly, you might have heard about the simple one I'm showing, which is referred to as a variational autoencoder. Even if you don't care about building predictive models, but you happen to use variational autoencoders, this next bit of the talk might turn out useful for you. Um, I'm seeing a question. Okay, I guess, I think, think we're supposed to, to take questions later. So let's do that. Oh, somebody raised hand. Right, I, I think I can just answer this. Yeah, so I, I understand that the recorded talk will be released and there is no open questions. Okay, somebody can answer it before without me. Uh, all right, great, so where were we? Now, uh, okay, yeah, so I was talking about variational autoencoders. And yeah, so in case you care about variational autoencoders, you might want to tune in for this because uh, I'm going to show a simple trick on how to improve them. So what's a variational autoencoder? Uh, in a variational autoencoder or a BE, we want to learn a generative model of the data, such as images. And specifically, we want to train a latent variable Z, such that sampling from a prior distribution and decoding disease into access produces reasonable images. And you can also use a very similar model for video prediction and training dynamics model as I've shown on the previous slide. But let's focus on this simple case where we just want to generate images entirely from scratch. So how does this work? In a VEE, you have an input that gets encoded into a representation and then generated back from this representation. It is convenient to think about VEEs as learning to reconstruct the data while constraining the representation complexity. The reconstruction loss measures the distance between the prediction and the true data. And in practice, one can use an MSC loss while the complexity loss is a kill divergence between the encoding and the prior distribution. Now, the question is, well, now that we have these two losses, we need to balance them. How can we do that? Many practitioners use beta VE, which simply provides an answer by tuning a constant, which is called beta, between the MSC loss and the complexity penalty. However, because of the additional hyperparameter beta, these models are often hard to optimize and tune. Here's what happens when you change the beta. If the beta is too low, as in these images at the bottom, the images will be unrealistic because the latent variable distribution does not match the prior distribution because the complexity penalty is too low. If the beta is too high, the images are blurry as the latent variable does not contain enough information to represent the images accurately as the ones on the top. Uh, and just to clarify, I'm going to be showing samples from the prior here uh, because this is, this is how you usually test these models. So, Practitioners who use beta VE know that beta is a very sensitive parameter and it often needs to be tuned separately for every data set and every model version. And the other problem with beta VE is that its objective does not actually correspond to a valid evidence lower bound and it cannot be used for, to measure log likelihoods, which uh, rules out some of the applications. 
So what we do want to do is we want to design a method that achieves a good balance between the two losses without manual tuning, and ideally also corresponds to a valid evidence lower bound. So let's look at um, how the evidence lower bound is derived. Um, this uh, will require us to define the decoder as, as a distribution. Uh, and we will use the likelihood of that distribution as the reconstruction term. Now, this is the this is the equation for the evidence lower bound. If you don't believe this, you can look it up. Uh, I won't go into detail on how you derive it, but let's just assume this is true and see how this actually works in practice and how people use this. So we want to arrive to the MSC loss that we used in the previous slide. And for this, we will want to use a Gaussian decoder distribution. The Gaussian log likelihood expands into an MSC term and the term dependent on the variance sigma squared. Uh, just to clarify, D here is the number of dimensions of your images. So we see that for a particular constant variance, this objective is equivalent to the commonly used MSC objective that we saw before. There is an MSC term and that there is a KL term. Unfortunately, this indicates a rather major problem with this simple MSC approach. Because remember that we needed to assume a constant variance, uh, and which means that we were actually severely rest restricting our decoder. The, the variance of the decoder is constant and it's not adapted to the data. So the decoder is not expressive enough to represent its conf confidence. In uh, a statistical sense, we will call such a decoder uncalibrated because it is not able to re represent the true distribution that it's supposed to represent. So to fix this, we will really want to learn this confidence, which is the variance sigma, end to end by training it with the full evidence lower bound, which contains both the MSC and the, uh, and the variance penalty term. Let's compare this to the beta V objective that we saw before. The variance of the decoder serves as a balance weight between the two losses. Beta V tunes this balance weight manually. Uh, but note that there's a direct correspondence between the sigma and the beta that can be seen by rescaling the objective. So in the, in the elbow, where you learn the variance, your MSC is scaled by one over two sigma squared. And in the beta V, your KL is scaled by beta. So there is a direct correspondence between the sigma and the beta. So we see that the sigma has to be adjusted to minimize the MSC term, but it cannot grow too large because of the logarithmic penalty, right? Uh, so the, uh, the elbow, when you learn the variance, actually tells you exactly how to adjust this balance term between the two losses. And we call this model that learns the variance of the decoder sigma VE. Why is it important to learn a calibrated decoder? Consider training a simple latent variable model, such as a Gaussian mixture model. If you fix the variance of all Gaussians to be a constant, for a high value of variance, the individual Gaussians will collapse as over here, because they are not able to, uh, to specialize on different data points as they become too wide. Conversely, if the variance is too low, uh, as over here, the individual Gaussians will be too sharp and will overfit to the data. As we saw already, the same phenomenon happens in the, in the more complex latent variable mo model, which is in VEEs. So here, if the decoder variance is too large, the latent dimensions will collapse and the samples will become blurry. Uh, so here you see samples becoming blurrier. And with the small variance, the samples might become unrealistic. So here they become more blurry, and here in reverse, they become more unrealistic as the, uh, as the variance becomes larger. Learning this variance end to end with the evidence lower bound, as I've just shown, automatically adjusts this confidence. Does it actually work better? Uh, here are some samples from the sigma VE as compared to Gaussian VE that uses MSC loss and beta equals to one. We see that the naive Gaussian VE samples are very blurry, while the sigma VE produces good samples here, as well as on some other data sets. So this is the Salve data sets of uh, faces of people, CIFAR, uh, which is uh, supposed to be uh, random images from the internet. You see that on CIFAR, the, neither model is too good, uh, but, um, uh, but the sigma VE is much better and the Gaussian VE is quite blurry. And the last data set is SVHN, which is Google Street View numbers. So you see that these numbers are a little bit more crisp with sigma VE. So this does seem to help to generate images. And what's really nice about this is that the same exact trick also works on a very different model trained for stochastic video prediction instead of generating images. Here are some videos generated by a model powered by the sigma VE. 
And we see that the Sigma VE model produces good videos on this data set of robotic arm movements, while the naive Gaussian VE removes the arm from the image eventually, as it is not able to retain the information as to where the arm should be. So you can think about it as essentially the image is being too blurry. They are so blurry that the arm just disappears. And the background is, fairly, background is fairly crisp because you can just copy the background over from previous frames. So this is a, this is a fairly nice result. And uh, it is encouraging in the sense of using these um, calibrated decoders for improving uh, probabilistic dynamics model models, but why isn't this trick used more often? Let's look at some architecture choices when learning the sigma. The naive way to predict the variance would be to predict different variants for every pixel in the image, which can be done by training an additional channel of the decoder. This is a very expressive choice because you have a variance for every pixel, but empirically we find that it almost, almost always leads to poor samples. Here, the FID numbers, which measure perceptual distance from the data distribution, are much higher for the four pixel sigma VE, even worse than for the naive Gaussian VE. So this naive per pixel sigma VE clearly doesn't work at all. In fact, in fact, it makes everything even worse. So instead, what we found works better is to train a single shared variance in a model that we call shared sigma VE. This method empirically works better, and it doesn't suffer from the numerical instability. However, the optimization of the shared variance is still a challenge. It can be learned simply with gradient descent, but this often requires careful learning rate tuning in order to achieve both stable training and fast convergence. We can further improve the optimization with an analytical estimate of the sigma in a novel algorithm that I call optimal sigma VE. I'm going to skip the details about optimal sigma VE, but the derivation is really fairly straightforward and you can find it in the paper or just ask me later. What I do want to talk about is the, the version of the model that is actually useful. Here's a large table with uh, all of the possible decoders pretty much that I could imagine. Uh, and I sh I'm showing the evidence lower bound in the FAD numbers. But what you need to know uh, is that the naive uh, unit variance Gaussian V works poorly, while the calibrated decoders generally work well. Sigma V versions are comparable to the manually tuned beta V and sometimes even better. And the optimal Sigma V tends to be the best. So to conclude, the VE requires significant tuning and produces unrealistic samples with low beta and blurry samples with high beta. Instead, our proposed sigma VE is able to find the sweet spot between the, these two modes, automatically learning a good value of beta. If you're interested in the paper, we have more analysis on how the sigma VE achieves that, where we confirm that it indeed learns a representation that retains the optimal amount of information empirically. And we do have some other tips on training VE models. And the code is also open source in both PyTorch and TensorFlow. And it is also very simple to implement. So if, if you're having troubles training your VE, or you're just curious about what's the best VE architecture, uh, this is a pretty good bet and should be easy to try. So I've just told you about one way to improve probabilistic predictive models. And we also saw that it is applicable to dynamics models and it can be used in the model-based reinforcement learning setting. I haven't shown this application, but uh, I actually did apply it in that setting. So if you, if you want to chat about this, we can do that later. And it does work there as well. We have also already looked a bit into where the data comes from, but cl clearly the part we are still missing is how to actually do the planning. And so in this final part of my talk, uh, I just want to really quickly tell you some ideas on how you might do planning that scales to long horizons. And specifically, I want to talk about a very recent work that is not even public yet, but if you're really curious about it, I'm happy to send you a preprint. So the results that I've shown you so far and the ones by other people do look fairly nice. But if you look closer, it is interesting that all of these tasks are fairly short in terms of time horizon. And this is not a coincidence. Current methods struggle on longer horizon tasks and might not work simply if the initial position of the arm was further from the object. So how can we make these agents scale to long-term planning? One of the major bottlenecks to scaling these is the planning algorithm itself. In fact, the most commonly used planning algorithm struggles even on this much simpler problem where the agent, a red ball, needs to navigate to the green target. 
the planner is not able to navigate around the obstacle and it is stuck in the local minimum on the other side. Let's see why this happens. The algorithm that most uh, visual planning work uses is random shooting with the cross entropy method, which means sampling random action trajectories and refining them towards the successful ones over time. Here, I'm showing you a sketch of this task you just saw and the trajectory is sampled by the shooting method. You can see that it fails simply because the search space is too large and it is not able to get around the obstacle. Let's look at how this works and how we can fix this in more detail. Again, since this is visual planning, we start with an image and we encode the image into a latent state. We also have a dynamics model that operates in the latent state and the reward predictor that defines the task. Shooting-based methods start with the initial state and sample future trajectories using the predictive model. The trajectories are evaluated with the reward and then we directly optimize the actions to maximize the total reward. So here I'm showing the optimized variables in green and the planning objective in gray. This is a very reasonable way to optimize actions, but we already saw that this optimization problem is just too hard on more complex tasks. So in this work uh, that I'm talking about right now with uh, Chuning Zhu, we tried to figure out whether there is a better algorithm one could use for the optimization. And the key insight that we had is to use collocation or transcription, which is a powerful method for trajectory optimization that has been shown to be very effective in traditional control and robotic settings. Here's how this works. In collocation, we define a sequence of future states and actions, and we are going to optimize them jointly. So both states and actions are shown as green. To ensure that the trajectory is physical, we will use constraint optimization with the constraint that the dynamics is satisfied. And we are still going to be optimizing the reward. Since the entire optimization is happening in the latent space of the learned model, we call this method latent collocation or LATCO for short. So again, the big difference if you're not familiar with collocation is that in the shooting case, we are optimizing just the actions while in the latent collocation, we're we're optimizing both the actions and the states to maximize the reward and satisfy the dynamics. Now, it might seem like what we just did just makes the optimization harder, right? Before we just needed to optimize for the reward alone, and now we need to optimize for the reward and the dynamics. But here's what's really interesting about this approach. In contrast to simple shooting, we can anneal the dynamics constraint, meaning that in the beginning of the optimization, we can enforce the dynamics constraint very lazily. So the planner, the planner can quickly discover the states with high reward by violating the dynamics. And then in the later stages, we enforce the dynamics constraint and we find a trajectory that actually reaches the high reward region and satisfies the dynamics. It turns out that this ability to relax the dynamics is very powerful and it lets us escape local minima that we saw earlier. So let's compare how shooting and collocation works on this simple task. As we saw, shooting doesn't do so well, and it is not able to discover the successful way to solve the task. In contrast, collocation quickly finds the high reward region in the very beginning, constructing plants that go directly through the wall. Uh, and so the plants in the beginning are shown in yellow, and then the plants towards the end, they become more green. As we enforce the dynamic constraint, um, the collocation further fine tunes the initial yellow, yellow trajectory to satisfy the dynamics. So you see that the final trajectory is actually feasible and it goes around the wall. So we see that this annealing trick allows collocation to escape local minima and optimize for longer term reward than prior work. All right, so we have a visual planning agent that can reason over long horizons. An actual question to ask is whether this agent can be also used to solve robotic tasks. To make tasks that require long horizon reasoning, we used uh, sparse rewards. So the agent only sees a positive reward when the goal is reached and otherwise sees zero reward. This ensures that the agent needs to plan all the way to the goal instead of, for example, relaying, relying on a shaped reward or a demonstration that provides dense signal as to how to solve the task. So here I'm showing the plans our agent makes on the robotic pushing task where the robot needs to push the red object to the green goal. These videos are the visual plans that are generated by our latent space planner. And we see that it successfully solves the tasks in many cases, even with the sparse reward signal. The agent is also successful at executing these plans. Yep, in contrast, shooting completely fails this task. 
Because the reward signal is so sparse, it is never able to discover the successful trajectory, and the plans don't even try to solve the task. And the executions also correspond to the plans. So you see that let go both, so in both cases, plans and executions are roughly the same. Plans are a little bit blurrier because these are predictions by a convolutional decoder. But LATCO is actually able, in many cases, to plan for the task and solve it. And shooting just is, again, stuck in the local minima because of the sparse reward. So just to show some numbers, our region uh, significantly outperforms shooting methods on the obstacle task, a robotic reaching task, and the robotic pushing task. Uh, and we are very excited about uh, where this will go in the future. Uh, the, this work is still um, is still a preprint, but but I think this is already a fairly solid proof that uh, latent collocation is a very good way to do planning in the visual model based level setting. So that's it for my talk. In terms of future work, I'm very interested in looking some more complex and multitask real world setups. Uh, including a longer horizon and more visually complex tasks. So if you have any ideas on what would be a good fit to try model-based RL on, definitely feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm always, always available. And to summarize, today I talked about how to collect data with stealth supervision, how to leverage human collected data, how to improve probabilistic latent variable models, and how to do long horizon planning. I do really want to thank uh, all my great collaborators on all of these papers, and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm also happy to chat anytime later on Slack or by email. Great, thanks so much, Oleg. And we have uh, a few PhD students uh, on the call right now. We have Edward, uh, Aurora, and Carl, all from CIS, I believe. Um, and yeah, I'll let you guys go ahead if you have any questions you'd like to start with. Uh, we'll also be taking questions for the Q&A interface from the audience. So please submit one uh, if you're in the audience and are interested in asking Oleg one as well. Uh, I guess one question I do have for the last project you talked about. First of all, nice talk. I really like all of your research. Uh, I do have a question for the last project that you talked about. So it seems that uh, with the current setup, you already start with a trained deep dynamics model that works in latent space. Is that true? Um, let me clarify. So um, for the collocations project, it, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be. So we have some experiments where we start with the uh, with existing data, and we have some experiments where we start with just random data and we collect new data with the collocation uh, planner. Uh, and uh, because some of the tasks that I have shown uh, are sparse reward, so let me just go back to the slide and uh, show the three tasks that, that, are, that are here. So the, op well, actually all of these are sparse reward. So uh, the, there's a very severe exploration problem. So if you just start with random data, you would, you would never see the reward. So you know you, you wouldn't be able to uh, to solve the task. Now you could of course use the first paper I mentioned, uh, but we just didn't run it yet. Uh, so to overcome the exploration, we train an oracle agent with dense reward, and then we use the data to jumpstart the model. But all of this is actually happening. All of the actual training is happening online uh, on most of these tasks. M meaning we we update the model a bit and we use collocation to collect new data and update the model a bit. And we also use MPC, meaning that we replan every 15 or so steps, and the planning horizon is 30. And I guess like one, so uh, the core idea of this work is like during the exploration steps, you not only optimize for the actions, you also have uh, having a consistent uh, dynamics model, right? So uh, I was wondering if a curriculum setup would work like at first, care more about getting optimized for uh, the action, maximizing the intrinsic reward. But then later in the training, you care more and more about getting consistent uh, actions with respect to your dynamics model. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's see. So, so, so just uh, again to clarify, yeah, so yeah, this is an extrinsic reward. And so the we do use this kind of annealing where first in the optimization, we optimize for the actions and the sort of the, the dynamics loss kicks in a bit later. That's how we escape the local minima. Uh, so we do actually kind of use that, but it's not really curriculum learning because we do it for a single planning. 
So when we need to construct a single plan, a single trajectory of actions, you know, the optimization is about 200 steps and we first optimize for the reward and then we, the, the dynamic loss kicks in. So we don't anneal it over the training. Uh, that could be something that's interesting, but I guess the main problem is that you do really have to optimize the dynamics loss for the trajectories to be meaningful at all, because otherwise what you'll have is the, the initial state will be at the initial position and all of the other states will pile up at the goal state. Mm -hmm. So the states are good, but the actions don't actually reach them. So you can't really execute this trajectory. Um, Oleg, so I have a question on the learning from observations project. Um, one thing I noticed is the observations seem to be in the same domain as the robot, um, at least in your examples. And I, I'm asking like, um, do you think this can actually generalize to like YouTube videos with uh, like noisier domains and like random distractor objects? Or if it's still worth um, just taking the time to collect uh, demonstrations instead of like these noisy observation uh, sequences? Um, okay. Should I have a Carl, question, Oleg? I think Carl wants to answer. Well, I, I can take some of the blame. Um, and and Carl, you, Carl, can elaborate. Is that, that's probably more appropriate. Sure. Uh, yeah, Go definitely. Ahead. I, mean, I would say that um, I don't know how much we really tried it. So, what, what kind of domain? So, you're talking about like doing it exactly from YouTube. So, this is true that the, here the domains are fairly similar. Uh, what, what Carl is trying to do right now actually has slightly more diff different domains. Although there the domain shift is, I think, also quite a bit harder. So I guess, yeah, I would say this is this is probably the main problem with this idea is the domain shift. The, the action representation stuff we kind of figured out, but how to address the domain shift is just, you know, just look up through whatever the CDPR papers are this year on domain adaptation and, and see if they work. They mostly don't. Um, and they probably don't work on YouTube. Uh, but I guess maybe ultimately the way to solve this would be to with, by having some human supervision in terms of hum, the human telling you how to align the domains. And maybe it wouldn't need a lot of this supervision. Maybe most of this can be done without supervision. But kinda, if you have a little bit of supervision, that would probably help you a lot. Do you want to add anything, Carl? Uh, yeah, sure. Um... So in uh, this paper, um, all the data was same camera, same cable. The only difference was the robot arm versus the human arm, which is still some domain shift, but not a lot. In the paper that we just submitted to Quarrel, well, just got accepted to Quarrel, um, that hopefully we'll have a preprint done in a few days. If you want, I can send you a copy. Um, just email me afterwards. Um, or message me on Slack or something. Uh, we're doing it with um, videos that I collected on my desk in my house and using that to control a simulated robot in a different looking environment. So we're handling more domain adaptation, uh, but it's still definitely one of the most challenging parts of this problem is how do you align these domains? Nobody else has more questions. I, I have one. Uh, so, so in plan to explore when you're talking about zero shot generalization, um, are, is, is that intrinsic rewards in that case? Uh, and if so, um, do you have an, have you done any experiments on how fast you can generalize when the re reward is extrinsic? Uh, yeah, so, so, so what's happening, so what do, uh, so the reward here is specified. So you, you get a reward function that is extrinsic. So this is this is what we do. Now, now of course the question is, how do you give the reward to the agent? So I think you're asking sort of if if the agent also needs to learn the reward by you know going in the environment and collecting your reward samples. How fast that yes. can be? Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah. So we yeah, haven't so looked into that at all because we, we just abstracted that problem away and we just assumed that the agent gets the function itself. Mm -hmm. Um, because again, we really want to see whether the predictive model is uh, good enough to support all of these tasks. And, and we see that sort of, you know, plan to explore does help a lot in sort of learning a more general reward model. 
the question that you ask is of course very interesting and it's very practical right so in practice if you if you want um if you want an agent to solve a new task you need to provide this task somehow and in many cases you would want to provide it with samples although i i don't <laughs> i wouldn't say that's necessarily the best way to provide the, the task like i guess so kind of the question is you know imagine you have an intelligent robot that can do mm -hmm. many things and you just need you need it to do what you want it to do but you don't speak mm -hmm. the same language right so like the question how do you communicate to the robot what, what it needs to do and for the robot to try doing things like and you know you providing the reward that, that would be a very silly way of doing that right so the robot would just try a bunch of stuff for a day and you will be standing there and saying yes and no, even though the robot right. can do your task, it just doesn't know what the task is. So I guess I, I don't actually know what the, like the question is to what's the best way to provide the task. Um, I would though imagine that, yeah, if you wanted to do literally that, you would have a hard time because sort of the robot would need to provide a diverse set of um, trajectories and you would need to pick the best one or something and that might take a long time. Mm -hmm. Do you feel hopeful that there there is some framework under which you can communicate tasks um, tasks in the form of a, a known reward function um, in you know a similar amount of data? Because I, I mean, if the answer is no to that, then it seems that you know zero zero shot in this case um, means that the you know learning the dynamics and the planning therefore it cannot be the bottleneck because it'll always be harder to even figure out what you're supposed to do. Yeah, I do think, that, I think this question is very much tied to the applications. So, so for some applications, for instance, you can specify a goal image or if your robot has some proper receptive sensors, you can say, well, your, your light leg needs to be you know, 20 feet forward and then the right. robot will yeah. walk forward. So that kind of stuff would work. Um, ideally, you would do it in natural language, right? But that's that means that you need to train the natural language stuff. So that's, I, I right. do think that this is probably way off. This is like this is way in the future, and I, I don't exactly know how you would do this. But I do think that yeah, communicating the goal image is some sometimes reasonable. Uh, yeah. Great. Thanks so much. That's probably yeah. I I, I think about this problem a lot, and the, the best the best practical thing I found is the goal image. All right, do we have any last questions before we call it? All right, then thanks everyone so much for coming to, to listen to this talk. Uh, and thanks uh, Ola for giving it and uh, Edward, Aurora and Carl for helping us with the Q&A section. Uh, we'll be back next week with an external speaker from MIT, Maria Bauza, who will be talking about uh, learning, manipulation, contact, and tactile sensing. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.